few Sabbaths back, we began a series of explorations. We're looking at the last hours of Jesus. We started where he began to feel more alone. We began with the Garden of Gethsemane. Then we had a message where we looked through. When he was arrested, the mob came, and all that happened there. Last time, we looked at the beginnings of Jesus' questionings, where, where he was being questioned by the high priest, by Annas, and then Caiaphas. And then parallel to that is something else you'll find. You'll find it in all four of the Gospels. And it is this situation with Peter and Jesus. Peter, John and Peter. And so today we're going to look a little bit at Peter's denial of his Lord. These are the last hours of Jesus. So you say, why looking at Peter? But you know, it's interesting. It's in all four of the Gospels. And there's a very fascinating connection between Jesus and Peter we're going to see. So our focus today is on this portion of these events as we continue working our way through the last hours of Jesus. Peter is one of Jesus' closest apostles. And Jesus knew Peter was present. There came a moment when Peter betrayed Jesus and when their eyes connected. So this night was an intense one for Jesus and for Peter. Intense in so many ways. For Jesus, Jesus had wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had been confronted by the mob in the Garden. He had stopped the melee and he had reattached the ear of the servant of the high priest. Then he began to be marched through these various hearings all night long where he's going to be questioned by Annas and Caiaphas and then to Pilate and so on. Tortured even through the night. So this was Jesus' night. But what about Peter? For Peter, this was the worst night of his life. In the garden, he had heroically lashed out with his sword to defend Jesus, only to have Jesus stop this melee and, and heal the wound he had inflicted. Then he'd urged the other disciples to flee the scene. And then Jesus had been arrested and taken away. Peter was so confused. The passages we're especially looking at tonight, if you want to make note of them, they're in all four Gospels. Matthew 26 especially verses 69 to 75. Mark 14, especially verses 66 to 72. Luke 22, 54 to 62. And even in the Gospel of John in chapter 18, verses 25 through 27, about there. We look at these all side by side. Let's kind of review these events as they shaped up. So after Jesus' Garden of Gethsemane arrest, the disciples flee to the four winds. But as we read the Bible, we can see that two of them, John and Peter, went back and they began to follow this party that was leading Jesus away, where his questioning began at, at Annas, the, the sort of retired high priest. They began at his house. So Peter and John followed the mob that took Jesus and finally took him to that where the questioning began. From there, of course, Jesus was taken then to another uh, sequence at the, where the Sanhedrin council was meeting, and they questioned him there and brought in all these bribed false witnesses all through the night. And we're not even done with this because we're going to find he goes to Pilate and then back and forth, and anyway, we'll come to that. But what we're going to consider here is a special piece of this night of emergency. Peter, Peter denied his Lord. How did that come to pass? Well, John was known to the high priest, and he was able to go get in and listen to the proceedings, and he talked talk to them on behalf of Peter, and they let Peter in. This is So Peter's listening in. John goes over and, you know, Jesus is, they're, they're questioning Jesus. There's a bunch of people there. John is there. He didn't try to, he's just being quiet. He doesn't try to pass himself off as someone other than who he was. 
but Peter. Peter was there. He was disoriented. He went and he warm, warmed himself by the fire as though he were one of those who had brought Jesus there for this hearing. And Peter's trying to kind of mix in. Peter, who had pulled the sword in the garden, he's now confronted by a servant girl. And she says, you know, I think that, I think that you've been with Jesus. Aren't you? You're one of Jesus' disciples. And now, Peter is kind of facing a moment. Remember, it's not too long ago, he's... He's cutting in the garden, right? Cuts off the guy's ear. Pretty bold. If you had 200 people with torches and knives and you would pull your, you pull your sword and confront them for Jesus, that's pretty bold. That's pretty heroic. Well, anyway, this same Peter, he's now confronted by the servant girl. And now merely an answer to the question of whether he had been with Jesus. He denies it. He denies it in front of the whole group there around the fire. Don't know what you're talking about. You can look at Matthew 26, verses 69 and 70, if you want to follow along some of these things. Now, Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, it says a rooster crowed then. Matthew, Luke, and John, they don't mention that particular crowing. But anyway, that is that is Peter's first denial. Now Luke 22:58 after that has Peter again denying and not too long after that and this whole situation around the fire is a bit confused and maybe you went camping before and um, sometimes you would stand by the fire and sometimes you would sit by the fire and get up and move around. I know that's how I've often done when we've been camping. And if you read one of the Gospels, it says they were standing, and the other one says they were sitting. Well, they were probably doing both at different times. There's different people, questions about who's asking what, and it's not completely clear. And you know, I don't think that it's important for us to have an exact transcript of who sat down when, who stood up when, which is the one that said this and which that said that. But what we do know is that they're gathered around the fire, Peter's there, Peter's confronted. Peter denies his Lord, not only once, but then a second time. And so this question just starts, it just keeps coming around. Well, aren't you one of the disciples of Jesus? And at the third time, Peter denies with swearing and oaths. No one has yet heard any of these disciples of Jesus swearing. You know, can you think of a time in all four Gospels when the Disciples began to swear. Nobody did that. His disciples were distinguished by the purity of their, their language. So this is a pretty good ruse on Peter's part. Yeah, that'll pretty much make sure. Well, I guess he's not one of them. Only he was. He's doing, he's, Peter is terrified and he's doing his utmost not to be identified as one of Jesus' disciples. In the book, The Desire of Ages, on page 712, Ellen White gives us this very striking paragraph. And I think there are some insights here into this. Peter had not designed that his real character should be known. In assuming an air of indifference, he had placed himself on the enemy's ground, and he became an easy prey to temptation. If he had been called to fight for his master... He would have been a courageous soldier, but when the finger of scorn was pointed at him, he proved himself a coward. Many who do not shrink from active warfare for their Lord are driven by ridicule to deny their faith. By associating with those whom they should avoid, they place themselves in the way of temptation. They invite the enemy to tempt them and are led to say and do that of which under other circumstances they would never have been guilty. The disciple of Christ who in our day disguises his faith through dread of suffering or reproach 
recognize his Lord as really as did Peter in the judgment hall. Ah, wow. Different people, you know, have different strengths and different weaknesses. Peter was heroic in the garden against the armed mob. But here in the presence of a few servants and a few other folks, and not at all very far from Jesus' physical presence, Jesus can hear some of this. Peter completely loses it. Under other circumstances, he would never have denied Jesus. And he proved that in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? But these aren't other circumstances. These are these circumstances. Now, if you were to make a list of the disciples, somebody said, okay, top, you know, we used to have these top ten lists. Well, let's say we had a top three list. Who are the three boldest of the 12 disciples? Who would you put on that list? You might put John in there. Does John and his brother, the sons of thunder? I'll bet you most of us would put Peter on the list, maybe near the top. Remember, many times Jesus would ask questions, and he'd look at the disciples, and the disciples look back at him, and, you know, the, the, the wheels were turning. They were trying to figure out what they wanted to say. Peter would speak right up. And so Peter was kind of a bold disciple. But now, now, you know, he's a man of action. Sometimes he acted first even and asked questions later. You know, that's Peter. But, under, but, but he, he did something. But this night, Peter was undone. Peter was undone. Matthew 26, 74, has, Jesus, has Peter cursing and swearing oaths, and you find it at Mark 14, 71. Mark has Jesus warning Peter that he's going to deny Jesus three times before the rooster crows twice. That's Mark 14, 72. Matthew and Luke and Peter... Matthew and Luke have Peter remembering that Jesus, that Peter, that, let me say this again. Matthew and Luke have Peter remembering that Jesus said that Peter would deny Jesus three times before the roosters crowed. Matthew 26, 75, Luke 22, 61. Now, I'm not completely sure how to sort all this out. You know, was it? Three times, two times, one time. I'm not completely sure how to, how to understand that. Somebody's probably really sorted that out well, but I haven't sorted that out. What we know is this, and this isn't a, a strike against the Bible. All the Gospels talk about this almost the same. And if we sat down and we had four, four people tell something that happened, you'd all give a slightly different explanation. What we do know is this, that, it, that while the denial was still on Peter's lips, the rooster crowed. Now there's something unique in the Gospel of Luke that's not told us in any of the other Gospels. Go to Luke 22, 61. For whatever reason, Matthew doesn't mention it, Mark does not mention it, and John does not mention it. But Luke mentions it. Luke was a physician, and Luke, Luke had a way of getting into the detail often. And there's an interesting detail here at Luke 22:61. What does it say there? The Lord turned and looked at Peter at just that moment. At just that moment. Desire of Ages 7.13, Ellen White offers us this. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master, and in that gentle countenance he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. So now remember, Peter and John, they were there to listen to the proceedings. 
And while all this was happening, the main action, you know, was, was, was with Jesus being questioned and all the questioning. Jesus, how much is Jesus talking? He's not saying too much. He's kind of silent before the shearers, right? But Jesus is aware that John and Peter are there. And he, he hears some of these things that are being said. And here's Jesus. He's being questioned he knows, he knows where this is all trending, but in Jesus' heart is that John and Peter are there, and so he's paying close attention. Peter was facing his own trials. I mean, the terror of seeing Jesus after his prayer struggles in the garden, the anger of the mob, the furious melee there, and the fleeing to save himself and seeing Jesus permit himself to be arrested and led away. It was the worst night in Peter's life. And now he's denying Jesus, swearing. But in that moment, when their eyes connected, Peter knew. Jesus, in spite of this relentless questioning and accusing happening around him, he, Jesus had been aware of Peter and John. And when Peter's voice was raised in swearing, Jesus must have heard it. Could you imagine that? Sometimes when a, when a pastor's coming, people lower their voices. Well, we don't want to say that in the presence of the pastor. Well, what about in the presence of Jesus? When Peter's voice was raised in swearing, Jesus must have heard it. And Jesus turned and he looked right into Peter's eyes. And Peter's eyes looked back into Jesus' eyes. What did Peter see in the eyes of Jesus? A mild rebuke? Maybe a firm rebuke? Did Jesus roll his eyes? Oh, Peter. No. Maybe some anger? I mean, here's Jesus. Oh, look, I'm dying to save the world. I'm dying to save, save you. You didn't have to say anything. Who are you? What do you think you're doing? Stop acting like a weasel. I'm, I'm Jesus. I'm dying for you. No. That's not what he saw in the eyes of Jesus. Desire of Ages 713. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused. Memory was active. Peter called to mind his promise just a few short hours before that he would go with his Lord to prison and to death. He remembered his grief when the Savior told him in the upper chamber that he would deny his Lord three times that same night. Peter had just declared that he did not know Jesus. But, now, but he now realized with bitter grief how well his Lord knew him and how accurately he had read his heart, the falseness of which was unknown even to himself. That's the end of the quote. This was the worst night of Peter's life. But it might also have been, it surely was the most important night of his life. Matthew and Luke both report that at that moment, Peter went out. And the description is two words. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. Peter had the worst night of his life, but it brought him to the best place of his life, the place of repentance. Repentance. Repentance is not a popular topic in our age. People are more inclined to double down than to repent. When's the last time you heard the word used on the news? Well, so-and-so said this, but they turned around and repented after that. Don't hear that. I venture to say, I mean, I don't watch them, but I venture to say that if you watch HBO programs or whatever, whatever TV series, 
movie series. I don't think the word repentance is going to come up basically anywhere. This is, this is a museum word at this point. Sorry. It shouldn't be. But this is an age when sin and iniquity and repentance, they're almost museum words. We, it's an age when we don't think about wrong that we have done or right that we should have done. Repentance, it's a ne neglected idea. People have a superficial idea about what repentance is. You know what they say? They say repentance means sorrow for sin. It includes that. It includes that. But a more correct understanding of biblical repentance is that it means sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. Turning away from it. When you go to the Old Testament, the literal Hebrew, it's called teshuva. Teshuva. It means you're walking one direction. And you turn 180 degrees. And now you're going in the opposite direction. That's the biblical understanding of what repentance is. The New Testament, the Greek New Testament, metanoia. I have literally a change of mind. Yes, a change of mind from going this way to going this way. That's what repentance is. To repent in concrete terms means to be going in one direction and to turn and go in the opposite direction. There are superficial repentances, you know, human repentances. Repentance is where the person is sorry they've been caught in the middle of the wrong act. There's a sorrow in a repentance like that. But there's not that distinct turning away from sin. The turning away from it, that's the part that bothers people. That's the old-fashioned part. That's the eternity part. How many times have they already tried to turn from sin, but they found themselves turned right back and doing wrong again? We fail over and over because we turn in our own strength. Or we turn... And when we try to keep going in that changed direction, in our own strength, we fail. Attempts like that are doomed to fail because human turning isn't worth much. But supernatural turning, turning in the power of the Holy Spirit, that can take you a thousand miles and more besides. Earth is not safe and we are not safe we need something deeper. Have you read that little book by Ellen White, Steps to Christ? On page 23, she's talking about repentance, and she calls it three words. She calls it a, a conversion of purpose. That's an interesting de description to put on repentance, a conversion of purpose. Where do you get it? Where do you get a conversion of purpose? Well, there's only one source. God is the only source for this. But God does not force us to receive him. The choice is ours. We all remember Romans 2 verse 4, don't we? Romans 2 verse 4, it tells us that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. It's not the goodness, it's not the goodness of, uh, of you. It's not the goodness of me. It's not the goodness of Mahatma Gandhi or Mother Teresa. Fill in the blank. It's not the goodness of anybody like that that leads us to repentance. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. It's not in you. It's in him. And we can turn the supernatural turn when we are looking to him. He's the only source. God is always drawing us. His spirit is always pleading with us. He's at work to heal and to save us, but not without us. There's a kind of a famous saying that somebody said centuries and centuries ago, he who created us without our help will not save us without our consent. That's not a Bible verse, but you know what? It's truth. He who created us without our help. Did, 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 did you have any part in creating you? He who created us without our help will not save us without Whose consent? Without our consent, you see. We need a power from beyond us, but the choice is our own choice. You know, we're living in an age where there's a lot of coercion and forcing going on. But guess what? God gave you free choice. 
He gave you free choice for you. The Tsar of Ages 297, man needs, what was the second word? Man needs a power outside of and beyond himself to restore him to the likeness of God and enable him to do the work of God. But this does not make the human agency unessential. Humanity lays hold on divine power. Christ dwells in the heart by faith. And through cooperation with the divine, the power of man becomes, here's what she said, becomes efficient for good. So our power can become efficient for good, but only as it's united with his power. And what's more, our power can never save us. We're not talking about that. Our power can never contribute directly to our being saved. But God is leading us toward himself, but we must choose to be led. God never forced anyone's footsteps for salvation. He gave you and I and Peter free will. The devils are always trying to destroy our free will. The devils are trying to train us to, to be acted upon without our and not, not have consent. God says, I will act for you. I will act upon you, but with your consent. And that night, see, we choose what we will become. And that night when Peter looked into Jesus' eyes and Jesus looked into Peter's eyes, that broke Peter's heart. He did not numb his heart or harden his heart or continue to give himself to fear. If the Bible says, he went out and wept bitterly. And that wasn't like three tears and, 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 you know, hit it with the hanky and he's done. That's not what we're talking about. In fact, you can read it in Desire of Ages. He ran all through that. He ran all the way back to the Garden of Gethsemane and collapsed on the ground there. Holy Spirit was working, and Peter received his work. The surgery that night didn't end when Jesus, you know, put the ear back on. The Holy Spirit was doing surgery on Peter's heart. But it was harder than it might have been. One last quote from Desire of Ages 7.14 had those hours in the garden been spent in watching and prayer, remember Jesus said, you know, watch and pray with me, Peter would not have been left to depend upon, listen, his own feeble strength. He would not have denied his Lord. Had the disciples watched with Christ in his agony, they would have been prepared to behold his suffering upon the cross. They would have understood in some degree the nature of his overpowering anguish they would have been able to recall his words that foretold his sufferings, his death, and his resurrection amid the gloom of the most trying hour. Some rays of hope would have lighted up the darkness and sustained their faith. The story, friends, of what happened that night would have been different. But they missed their privilege, and they didn't watch and pray with Jesus back in Gethsemane. Jesus knew that night would test them as never before. He tried to get them to the source of help and strength they needed. You know, he led them, I guess you could say, to the water, but, but Jesus never forces us to drink. When you wake up in the morning, God gives you breath. Your heart is beating because God's giving you life. And the first thing in the morning, what do we do? Some of us reach for that, that little rectangle check our phone. I know about it. You know, we should reach to another rectangle. Start with God. He's going to lead you to the water, but he's not going to force you to open the page. And so we want to start our day with God. He'll give us strength we need. Why did Peter fail? He didn't know himself. And he relied upon his own tiny strength.
If you bring Arnold Schwarzenegger in here at the height of his, you know, of his muscles, right? Bring him in here, pretty strong, potent fellow. You know what? If he relies on his own strength spiritually, what's the end of that? Friends, we rely on our own strength and we fail. Because he did not know himself, Peter denied the one who loved him most, more than mom, more than grandma, more than dad. And I, I don't want to say this. I don't even want to admit it. But hidden, not very deeply, inside loud and bold Peter was a coward. And hidden not so deeply, perhaps, in you and I at our loudest and boldest, is a coward. Behind the arm of the sword wielder was a man who could be intimidated by a servant girl, and the privilege he failed to receive made it harder for him in his own testing. We want to share one more thought together before we conclude. Now, this series is walking us through Jesus' last hours. I want to just come back a little bit now, and I want to try to look at this a little bit from Jesus' perspective. We're following, trying to follow out you know, all the four Gospels and these pieces. Now, from Jesus' perspective, do you believe that Jesus was surprised? When that crowd came for him in the garden, was he surprised? Did he say, what have I walked into? What are these people doing here? No. He completely knew what, was, what would happen. He was not surprised when his own disciples fled for their lives. He was not surprised by the questionings and reasonings and all the false testimony and all that violence against him when they hit Jesus and batted him around and, and began all that stuff. Was Jesus surprised? No. The Gospel of John it tells us Jesus did not entrust himself to men. Why? Because he knew what was in man. Jesus knew the worst that humans could do, and he expected it, and he got it. He was not even surprised when Peter denied him. Peter, I will go to you, to, I will go to prison and death with you. Jesus said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times tonight. Oh, we'll never deny you. See, he was not merely in human form, Jesus. He was human. He experienced human hurting and suffering, not only physically, but emotionally. His brain works like your brain works. He had feelings like us. The joys and sorrows of living affected him as deeply as it affects you and I. Human. When Peter was standing at the fire and making like, like he was a different person, that he was indifferent to this. Jesus was there. Jesus was nearby. Jesus, it seems, was aware then of the presence of John and Peter. While the questioning went on, he kept, Jesus kept some of his attention on them. You know, he's, he's, he's paying attention. He knows they're there. He must have heard some of Peter's denials, Peter's loud oaths and claims, I do not know the man. Imagine yourself, you're about to die for a man like that. I'm going to die, I'm innocent, I'm going to die for these guys, and he's denying me right here. You might feel some anger, you might feel some disgust at the baseness of that person, the selfishness. He's denying me, what? But when Peter and Jesus' eyes locked what was on Jesus' face? Only a look of compassion and forgiveness. And that tells us what Jesus felt 
not anger, not disappointment, but what Jesus felt as he looked into Peter's eyes and Peter looked at Jesus, he felt compassion and forgiveness. God's love is, God doesn't love as something separate from himself. He is love. He sees us fall and he still is love. He sees us fall and still, still this is true. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. Peter saw himself now for what he was. Peter, he saw his need of all of Jesus' strength. The, the, the denial of Peter didn't surprise Jesus, but it cut Jesus very deeply because of the senseless betrayal that it in fact was. This was, except for the Garden of Gethsemane, this was the hardest part of the night when Jesus heard Peter deny him. That was the hardest thing for Jesus' heart. But he didn't get angry. He gave, Jesus, he gave Peter a look of compassion and forgiveness. Oh, friends, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. It was only a few years before this that Jesus had worked a miracle, and Peter had bowed in the bottom of his fishing boat, and he said to Jesus, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And then another time Peter said, Lord, you have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? And then when Jesus asked the disciples, men say that I'm this, who do you say that I am? Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter. And I believe that that, that Friday morning, that pre-dawn chill of that awful Friday morning, Peter finally gave himself entirely over to Jesus in that morning. And the book of Acts and First and Second Peter tell a mostly glorious story of Peter's journey from that time until we understand that he was eventually himself martyred. He did die. He did exactly what actually he said he would do. He died for his Lord. But this Thursday night, Friday morning thing, this was, this was quite a time. Quite a time. So friend, do not despair when you've betrayed Jesus. Return back to him. Seek his forgiveness. The devil wants you to think that God is up there sharpening his thunderbolts, you know? And he's frowning at you. And he's looking for a chance to squish you with some gusto and interest. But instead, Peter and Jesus' eyes met. Jesus looked into Peter's eyes, who had just swore that he didn't know him. And Jesus gave him a look of compassion and forgiveness. And Jesus has for you a look to your eyes of compassion and forgiveness, not a look of condemnation. He wants you. He wants you in the kingdom. So do not despair when you've betrayed Jesus. Return back to him. Seek his forgiveness. He has, what's that word again? He has repentance for you. He has forgiveness for you. He has hope and power and restoration for you because it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so from Jesus' angle, Jesus was being questioned, but he had his eye on his disciples. And Jesus has his eye on you for good. And when you go out from here today, don't forget that. 